everyone, my name is Soraya Juris, and today I will be interviewing Zainab Naim. The following is a recorded interview with Ms. Zainab Naim from the Fatima Jinnai Women University. She's getting her PhD in environmental science, and she also works for the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in Pakistan. So to get ourselves started, please introduce yourself broadly. Where did you go to school and what institutions have you been a part of and are you part of currently? So I am doing my PhD in environmental sciences. Uh, I completed my uh, master of philosophy in the same discipline and the bachelor's as well in the same discipline from mm-hmm. Fatma Jinnah Women University. Uh, it is uh, one of the leading public sector women universities in Pakistan. And mm-hmm. uh, as far as my PhD is uh, concerned, I think um, it, it's been funded by the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. And the project that I'm working on is uh, regarding uh, earthquake and hazard res- risk resilience in Pakistan. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to map uh, active fault zones based on radon uh, assessment and electrical con- uh, conductivity in the soil and water. So I am trying to uh, assess how electrical conductivity can be considered a um, primary or secondary precursory phenomena of um. earthquakes. So that's what I'm doing. And um, previously, my research was, again, it was uh, more focused on disasters, resilience, and soil sciences. But now I'm working at uh, Sustainable Development Policy Institute, Islamabad. So could you tell me a bit more about the Sustainable Development Policy Institute? It is a research-based policy think tank, uh, one of the leading think tanks of Pakistan, and also has been ranked globally by the University of Pennsylvania global think tank uh, ranking. Um, So uh, basically, if I talk about the Institute, um, uh, as I've mentioned, it's a research-based policy think tank. It is uh, directly, uh, you know, providing research and uh, policies to the government and the other sectors. And uh, the policy recommendations are being, you know, taken up by the government and they're mostly integrated in the policy, uh, policy process. So uh, the think tank has like three important pillars. Uh, first is research, second is capacity building, and third is advocacy. So uh, in research, we have uh, different units established. Uh, there is a unit on environment, uh, sorry, there's a unit on energy and environment. There is a unit on climate and migration. Uh, then we have unit on uh, uh, economy, uh, pu- public and private sector engagement. Um, then we have a business uh, development unit. Uh, we and there are certain other units as well. Um, and and they are doing uh, research and engaging with different uh, donor agencies and uh, different organizations at uh, international level, national level, corporate level. Uh, so uh, we get. Uh, projects uh, funded by those organizations and we engage uh, the you know local government and the national government with the donors through lo- those projects to get them implemented and most of the projects they do get implemented um and through advocacy uh, what we do is we try to create uh, a policy we try to improve uh, the research language and you know uh, for to engage our local people here what we are doing we try to communicate the policy with them through advocacy and under advocacy we conduct different seminars different webinar series and we have different you know like monday webinars they're a regular thing we are mostly celebrating the un um, special days whether it's on poverty it's on children or anything and then we engage the government and private sector to you know um, commit uh, certain policies which can help uh, the sec- different sectors that's what we do in advocacy under capacity building we provide uh, trainings to the professionals and corporate sectors and even to the academia and students for like uh, different professionals and trainers are hired and they engage with them to provide trainings on communication skills leadership skills soft skills and hard skills as well so and even under certain projects, uh, we do engage uh, our capacity building trainers at rural level and local level to provide capacity building trainings to the people. So that's what we are doing. 
Um, uh, STPI has uh, an annual flagship event every year. That is the Sustainable Development Conference, which is an international conference. And uh, like throughout the year, we work uh, to make this pro uh, uh, this conference a success. And the Sustainable Development Conference has an overarching theme every year. It is the theme is the umbrella theme is different, and then there are different panels within the theme. So this year's theme is like. Uh, uh, it is building better, building forward better, and uh, sustainable development in the unusual times, building forward better. Yeah, that's the theme this mm -hmm. year. And under the umbrella theme, we will be having different panel discussions, plenary sessions, podium sessions, and you know, uh, with different donors, different go government, um, federal ministers, local ministers, and even the in international delegations on climate, energy, economy. Uh, society, social protection. So it's it's there on the website sdpi.stc. So you can check if if you would like to attend the conference, whether in person or online. You are most welcome awesome. to join us. Um. So that's that's what STPI is doing. And my role at STPI uh, as of now is of a research associate. And also I am uh, managing the social media platforms for the organization as an additional role. And the focus of my research is on climate diplomacy, climate communications, and uh, circular economy. Uh, on the sidelines, I'm also working on uh, uh, energy sector, like uh, net metering and uh, renewable energies. So that's what we are doing. And um, this year, like I am uh, hosting two plenary sessions at the conference. One is on circular economy, closing the loop, where we will be engage engaging corporate sector, FMCG, and how they can, you know, come up with uh, regularizing uh, the plastics and you know how we can close the loop when it comes to the developing countries and the other plenary session is on climate diplomacy how the south asia can learn from from the eu uh, diplomatic model in pakistan india bangladesh nepal because we are bearing the brunt of climate change so what we can do to you know communicate our crisis to the global north and how we can come up with something that has a um, like major effect not unlike sark sark has like it has stopped at all and nothing there, there's no progress mm -hmm. on sark so that's what we will be discussing this year by engaging european union and different think tanks how do you see gender and development relating? What can we do to empower women for development? So gender uh, is one of the key things that uh, we have to, you know, emphasize in whatever we do, whether it's research, whether it's the hiring process, whether it's the capacity building, where in every pillar of SDPI, gender equity is what we believe in. And we have to mainstream gender, whether we are writing our proposals for research, whether we are conducting seminars, whether we are, you know, it's our conference and we have to be very careful when it comes to mainstreaming gender and gender equity. We have to create gender balance panels and, you know, integrate yeah, more women voices. So, so that's what uh, we do. And we have uh, on gender, we have been working to mainstream, uh, to promote uh, mainstreaming in context of resilience, uh, disaster resilience and mm -hmm. climate change. Uh, we have been working to, you know, how the role of women in policy making can be improved, how the role of women in uh, at tech and education sector, specifically when COVID was here, so the education was transformed to the digital education and how women can lead their roles, how they have uh, improved this sector. You know, so SDPI has been directly engaging with the academia uh, regarding this thing because women were playing a very important role and because I myself is from a women <laughs> university, so that's what we, we are focusing more. Uh, but uh, if I say that uh, it's all uh, like... Uh, it's really everything is hundred percent perfect here. No, uh, that would be wrong because Pakistan's gender parity, parity index has declined uh, a lot oh, over the wow. years. I did um, not know that. Yeah, the problem the problem is that we need more women uh, in the leading roles uh, at the policy level. Uh, for now, we have uh, if I talk about like uh, COP twenty seven is happening. Mm -hmm. So our federal minister for climate change is uh, Sherry Rahman, and uh, she's a leading woman vocal voice for uh, you know promoting uh, climate advocacy climate diplomacy and raising the voice of the global south what was her name i'm sorry i missed that it's sherry rahman okay oh yeah 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 okay yeah yeah 
So, uh, so she uh, has been very vocal and she has been taking a stance for uh, women role and mainstreaming gender and gender recovery, even during floods in Pakistan, she has been doing a lot for women. And now uh, it's not just like, uh, this is what I've uh, discussed at government level. If I talk about private sector level, there have been so many female leading voices uh, who have helped directly, uh, you know, in the field, they were there when floods, uh, when the, the areas were under flood and under flood water. They were there providing women with basic sanitation and hygiene, uh, uh, you know, uh, needs. They have special needs. So they were there providing them with basic uh, facilities. When the government was not there, those women were there because they understood what women needed. And SDPI wow, is really right awesome. now. Yeah, they are yeah. conducting a need assessment also. And um, our teams have been on the field in Balochistan and in Sindh, and they are trying to, uh, you know, record the voices uh, of those people, girls and children, how they are suffering. There have been cases of uh, water about diseases. There have been cases of snake bites. There have been cases of harassment. And that's what mm -hmm. uh, our teams are there and, you know, trying to record that. So um, uh, STPI is uh, doing a lot. Uh, also, um, last year, I think, uh, the Capacity Building Unit, they conducted uh, workshops uh, in rural areas of Punjab uh, regarding the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, engaging women voices at local government level. And workshops were conducted in different villages of Pakistan. And even women in energy uh, have been, uh, this has been also an, um, an initiative by SDPI. We also developed a women parliamentary caucus on climate change. Uh, that was uh, a big achievement because there was no women parliamentary mm -hmm. caucus and you know uh, before uh, this in Pakistan and SDPI took the lead and initiated this and now women parliamentarians are uh, engaged directly they have a separate caucus at the government level and that's what SDPI did. What adaptation strategies do you think will work in Pakistan? Okay first of all uh, if I talk about the ground realities uh, Pakistan is a cash strapped country. It, it is a developing country. And, you know, the UNDP has ranked it below the least developed countries ranking this year, uh, mm. probably because uh, we have been through COVID. We have uh, been sure. suffering through different crises, political, economical, and, and uh, geopolitical crises as well. Yeah, and now after COVID, what we were what we were faced with was Russia Ukraine war. The ripple effects were felt throughout South Asia. So mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan already the inflation rate was high. Economically, we were cash strapped, and then there was this war crisis. There were few. There was fuel inflation. There was food insecurity issue because wheat prices soar globally. So, um, and now the population uh, is another biggest factor. I think that is the major factor for so many crises that we are facing. Uh, it has crossed like um, above what, what it was projected already. So uh, the population crisis, and we have not been able to manage that. Uh, there has been urban sprawl. And secondly, uh, over the Russia-Ukraine war after COVID, there was climate change. So Pakistan mm -hmm. is facing triple tree crisis is sorry triple c crisis that is conflict covid and the climate change so we are facing either directly or in the form of a ripple effects the triple c crisis have affected us so we are in unusual times so keeping this thing uh we are also under heavy debts uh by the imf uh keeping this in mind if we talk about Pakistan can do something about adaptation, I, I mean, I would be living in, in some denialism or delusionalism if I say that, yes, we are going to do something about adaptation. That is practically not possible and achievable. And that's what we are advocating at COP27. Uh, basically, I, from STPI, uh, I was engaged by my organization with the Ministry of Climate Change directly to provide uh, technical support regarding COP negotiations. So I have been working with them directly. And what mm -hmm. we are trying to advocate this year is we need to mend the broken bargain between the global north and global south. Because without that uh, mending that bargain, uh, climate adaptation and resilience is completely, it, it is not possible. And how can you say that a country who has been suffering um, should share the equal burden of you know climate action with those countries who are actually creating the crisis? So th that is not climate justice. You cannot Absolutely. expect that from us. 
And also we are not contributing to the global GHG emissions. We have not been given the opportunity to, you know, do that kind of development that the sure, yeah. global north so we cannot completely phase out coal. If I say that Pakistan will be going towards phasing out coal, that is not possible. As I've mm -hmm. mentioned, the macroeconomic and geopolitical crisis, we cannot completely phase out coal. It's going to take us years. There are so many developed countries already out there who have done the development, who have contributed a lot, yet they're not ready for the degrowth that the IPCC has proposed. Then how mm -hmm. can we expect Pakistan or the countries like Pakistan to phase out coal? completely that we cannot do it is going to take us time we we are committed you know last year in our ndcs we did commit to phase down the emissions uh by 2030 and by 2050 50 percent reduction would be achieved but we cannot eventually phase it out as for now mm -hmm. that's not possible so adaptation we need support we need uh, the loss and damage facility, finance facility to get established at COP27. And mm. we need it to get established based on the Santiago network mechanism that has already been discussed and provided that how the facility should work actually. Um, as of now, Pakistan, uh, since it's chairing the G77 plus China block and, uh, you know, the agenda item has been tabled and it has been, you know, the negotiation there. But the point that has been that has not been discussed will be providing the finance because nobody is ready to discuss who will be providing the finance, although the responsibility lies with the global north. Uh, because they made these commitments during Paris Agreement and uh, the ad even under the adaptation fund, they have not been able to accelerate the adaptation fund for the developing countries. So adaptation for Pakistan would only be possible only if L&D facility, finance facility gets established at COP27. Without that, uh, it's we do not need charity. That is not what we deserve. We are not asking for charity. We are What we are asking is for our right. For adaptation, we need the finance without finance we cannot do we cannot do adaptation and even if i talk about what pakistan has been doing in context of taking climate action pakistan has done a lot more than so many other countries uh despite of meager resources the billion tree tsunami 10 billion tree tsunami was like a landmark project for pakistan where pakistan uh we improved the plantation cover and it was um, it was uh, like uh, 10 billion trees were planted across the country and under the clean climate green index uh, program launched by the ministry of climate change pakistan launched so many restoration ecological restoration projects uh, throughout the country you know the national parks the number of reserve national parks has been improved there has been uh, uh, national climate change policy has been launched gender action climate change gender action plan was recently launched under gcf by the ministry of climate change with support from the iucn so uh, secondly we have also launched uh, the renewable energy policy we have launched so many other projects to you know take climate action to mitigate the climate uh, crisis but even then we are suffering so the problem is not with what pakistan is doing the problem is what the world is doing so cop 27 is right now what does this mean for the sustainable development policy institute yeah, and uh, COP27, uh, SDPI is there at COP27. Mm -hmm. um, uh, SDPI, our executive director, Dr. Abit Soleri, he's one of the uh, members, uh, board members of uh, the Ministry for Climate Change. And mm -hmm. he is there representing uh, SDPI in Pakistan with the de delegation of the Ministry of Climate Change. And he's there at the Pakistan Pavilion. He's also, um, you know, representing uh, us at different forums. One of the forums is like Climate Action Network, uh, where he will be speaking today. And uh, uh, our other team members are also there, like uh, Dr. Hina Aslam is le the lead research associate fellow at STPI, and she's leading the energy unit and the uh, CPEC center as well. And she is CPEC study center, and she is also going there, I believe, tomorrow or day after tomorrow to launch the SD7 roadmap that SDPI uh, has, uh, you know, initiated with uh, Ministry of Energy and and that would be launched at COP. And also recently, um, we have worked with Climate Action Network South Asia uh, on uh, developing national report on uh, urban 
urban climate resilient development in Pakistan. And I believe uh, findings of those reports will be shared uh, during different side events of COP27. So that's what my uh, organization is uh, doing there at COP27. And after COP, um, during uh, we are having this uh, annual conference that I've mentioned from 5th to 8th December. And after COP, the briefing, debriefing, and what uh, were the key takeaways of COP27, they will be shared during the conference as well that will take place in Islamabad. Uh, so that's what we are doing at COP27. And yeah, I think um, yeah. I've spoken enough if you have any other questions because I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. No, that that's that's a lot. That's very good. That's um that's fantastic. Um let's see, I was scribbling notes. Um yeah, you know, I really like this this phrase you used, mend the broken bargain. I think that's such a great way of describing the way that the global north kind of looks at this whole situation it's like oh like we they need and it just you said that you're in like a your pakistan has like imf loans and there it's like created this really bad economic system do you think that there's any chance for grants to be given so um base, uh, basically when we had floods we were uh, the IMF program uh, was under review and Pakistan before floods Pakistan was like uh, you know we really needed that uh, support from the IMF the program was under review and they were mm -hmm. uh, due to decide in August but what happened then there, there were floods in Pakistan and uh, uh, what should I say? What they did, uh, the IMF did after the after the floods, when the pro program was under review and all, they they uh, sent their representatives and it was all reviewed. And when they uh, uh, you know they decided, okay, that we are going to provide some grant to Pakistan, but mm, in that okay. uh, in that discussion and in that report, they did not mention anything regarding floods in Pakistan. Like it was not there in their document. It it was not there in their you know in their uh, press releases that we are helping Pakistan for floods. No, they did not help us at all. If I say that IMF did mm -hmm. something when Pakistan, you know, thirty three million people were affected and. The loss and damage is it, it's huge it's above 40 yeah. million dollars us dollars so and you're how still can... rebuilding from that right exactly the water yeah. has not receded one of my colleague recently <sighs> went to the sin province which is still underwater the people oh there God. they cannot go back to their homes so everything has been destroyed there every single asset has been taken away by by the floods so they, they're not going back they're still in living in the camps and the situation is horrible like i i cannot even uh even share what what people there are feeling it's getting cold and women and children they're under open sky and imf yeah. did not mention that they are here to support pakistan for the floods the word flood was nowhere mentioned the grant they provided was peanuts why do you even why do you think that is that they didn't mention that that's that's what global north does you know that's <sighs> what they do with south asian countries with the global south yeah. that's what they're doing it's like a hegemonic kind of behavior they are ready to put pakistan under sanctions of any kind you know they can send you under the gray list where different countries will be, would be prohibited to conduct trade because okay the pakistan is like uh, uh, creating this problem and pakistan is a dangerous country so just put them under the gray list and that would be justified but they're not ready to help you uh, regarding the climate-induced disasters that we are facing because of them. They're not, not ready to take the blame at all. So IMF did not yeah. mention the floods and they did not provide any sort of, you know, relief to Pakistan during the crisis. And that's why we have been shouting to the world that what we need is not grant or charity. What we need is our right. We did not, uh, you know, deserve this kind of menace. Mm -hmm. And it is not just Pakistan. It, you know, initially earlier this year, Pakistan and India, both of these countries were engulfed in heat waves. People mm -hmm. died in like the countries. <laughs> there was food insecurity, crops were affected, and uh, the temperatures like they rose above 50, 50 de degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Unbearable temperatures were there. There were droughts reported. There was no rainfall. It was a dry spell throughout South Asia. And just imagine the level of, you know, dryness and no water in the desert, desert, desert areas of Pakistan and India. 
nobody spoke about you know pakistan and india both suffered from glacial lake outburst floods during that mm-hmm. time and it was already known that we will be having floods sheri rehman tweeted during uh, the may that we are facing gloves in the north we will be having monstrous monsoon this year but the impact like even she was not able to uh, you know think the kind of impact that we would be having uh, mm-hmm. that was uh, unimaginable it was monsoon on steroids that's what oh she God. says so and even now um we are facing this and the imf is not there but we are under debt crisis so uh, the strategy that uh, there are so many strategies even if they're not ready to you know give us the relief of some you know direct kind of relief they can go for they can help us in uh, providing debt swaps green bonds green swaps credits anything any scheme mm-hmm. that can you know help us to uh, relieve this burden for now because we need it but they are not ready to talk about it at all mm-hmm. that's why why we are raising the concern uh, our prime minister is there at cop 27 and he is discussing i was just listening to his uh, mm-hmm. uh, conference uh, with the antonio guterres the un secretary general and um, he was uh, saying it like loud and clear that we do not need the charity we need mm-hmm. you to establish the finance facility so that if If it's in Pakistan today, it will be upon you tomorrow. All right, everyone. That was Miss Zainab Naeem. It was such a pleasure speaking with her. Um, thank you so much, Zainab, once again. And I look forward to speaking in the future.